it's of course a big, a great pleasure and honor to make a few remarks on this occasion. And, you know, I think the modern world is becoming more and more anonymous. And we don't know anything about each other. So let me make a few remarks about myself to start with. Okay. So I want to tell you a few stories about my younger years. So my curriculum is that I studied at ETH between 1965 and 69. And in the summer of 1972, I got my PhD. I decided to get married and to claim that I'm now grown up and responsible for myself. Now, before that, I think I grew up in an environment that had a special charm. And it was sort of a protected environment of a sort that doesn't appear to exist anymore. So my teachers, maybe I should mention who the people were who sort of shaped me in my younger years. These were <coughs> Fiertz. These were the theories. They were all doing mathematical physics. That, of course, could be viewed as a disadvantage. I was forced to become a mathematical physicist. I have never regretted it, but there were some disadvantages, as we will see. Now, the first lesson I was taught by these people was that it is perfectly possible to completely disagree with what you hear in a lecture. It is possible to criticize the lecture, even in a very clear and open, direct way, and nevertheless have full respect for the lecture. This is something that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, I was at this meeting on topological insulators at the university. And I have to say I was alarmed by the atmosphere. People were got away with, you know, very strange behavior and very strange stories. And nobody complained. And I think that's not good. We should not be hypocritical. We should take it for granted that we are decent people and that we respect each other. But it should be legitimate to express criticism. Otherwise, the uh, science, we do, a, we do a disservice to science if we don't do that. We should try not to ignore people, especially young people. Young people want to be taken seriously, and they want to be asked what they are doing. They want to be supported. I think nowadays there is so much noise in the system that we tend to ignore Many people, including ones who should not be ignored and who might be extremely promising. Yes, and of course we should try, we should make an effort to remain honest. And, you know, for example, one thing I really dislike is people who give an account of the history of some development. But in every second line, they leave out somebody, and they know it, and they get away with it. If you talk about history in a seminar, you have to give an honest account of the history. So these were things I learned, and I think it's a type of knowledge that is in danger of getting lost. And so that's why I wanted to mention it. Now, of course, this was the tradition in Zürich. The, the th scene when I was a student was still shaped a lot by Pauli, who was apparently an extremely aggressive person who would criticize other people in the most uh, abominable way. But he was also a very generous guy. I mean, he shared many of his ideas with other people. The ideas went away, and he never complained about it. And I think he had respect for his colleagues. But he had this personality 
that was sort of aggressive. And Joost was like that. In fact, as a young man, Joost was apparently a superpower. He was extremely aggressive. When I got to know him, he was a very mellow kind person <laughs> whose, whose main purpose was to support young people and encourage them to do good work. And I think that's maybe one of the jobs we should do as we grow older. In any event, so maybe what I'm saying here has a little bit of something to do with the tradition in which I grew up. Lesson two, something went wrong here. You see, when I was a student, I was told that, for example, particle physics is all in a big mess. Quantum field theory doesn't work. It's terrible. Nothing works. It's all a disaster. And so I was encouraged to look at the very mathematical developments in quantum field theory. I learned axiomatic field theory as a PhD student. I've never regretted it, but it is a very limited view of what quantum field theory is about. And then I tried to do some work in constructive quantum field theory. And although I believe that there were very interesting mathematical methods developed in the community of constructive quantum field theorists, the negligence of physically interesting questions was alarming in hindsight, and it was a big mistake because, you know, simultaneously to the, those developments that I was confronted with, there was the development of Fadeyev Popov gauge theories. It later evolved towards uh, BRST, Batalin Wilkowski. These were the developments that we never heard of, and that was clearly a mistake. Then came up the idea of the renormalization group. We were told this will never become mathematically respectable. It all looks like, you know, some kind of higher BS because it could not be converted into clear statements that made mathematical sense. So we were not encouraged to look into these things. That was a big mistake. So I think we have to try to remain open-minded and even as mathematical physicists, we have to try to take seriously developments that sound interesting, even if mathematically they might still be in a very confused stage. At least that is my opinion, and that's the lesson I was taught by all the good things we were missing when I was a young man. And I, I have made good experiences with this lesson. I try to remain open, as open-minded as I can be. So, all right, that was not. Then lesson three, you know, I think math in the combination of the two words, mathematical physics, physics is as important as mathematics. And physics is usually not communicated in the form of theorems. And a premature emphasis on mathematical rigor is a disservice to the field. And I have missed, personally, I could now give a list of things that I have been thinking about, and I think I had reasonable ideas, but I never published them because I could not formulate them as theorems. And that was a mistake. Nowadays, I would not have any inhibition to express some ideas that are not theorems yet, but look interesting physics-wise. And I encourage people, to, all of you, to do that too. We do not always have to prove theorems. All right, that's lesson three, and then maybe there was a uh, well, okay. Of course, I also learned other lessons, some of them later on, Maybe I can go through the list briefly. And if you are not interested, tell me. I can cut this short. But I thought it was good to, you know, once go through some of these lessons. So one of the things I find absolutely alarming nowadays is the degree to which scientists can be manipulated. You know, we are confronted with this BS of the writings of the age index 
of the importance of funding, in particular funding that comes from very exotic sources where you have to make a huge effort to attract the funding. We all do it. We comply with these rules that usually are imposed on us by some pretty stupid politicians or administrators, and nobody but tests. And I think especially I'm as an old man. I as an old man should resist these trends and occasionally encourage my younger friends to also resist. I think we really are, the, the degree of manipulation has reached a very dangerous stage. You can see it with the electronic media. We are manipulated in believing that every hour we have to check our email because otherwise something may go wrong. And that's not good. I also believe we shouldn't worry too much about our images. We just do what we find interesting. And m maybe, as I said, we should not assign too much importance to grants. I would like to tell you the example of George Mackey, who was a group theorist at Harvard, and I knew him reasonably well, and he said he's never going to apply for grant money because he cannot promise what he will do. If he promises that he will do research on this or that aspect of some group, then it's probably not interesting because he already knows how the work will go and he doesn't want, he doesn't have time to do uninteresting work just to please people of a granting agency. Now, perhaps this is a world that doesn't exist anymore. I think we are under much more pressure to apply for grants and, uh, you know, do something about our standing and so on. But at least we should be aware that that this has a lot of disadvantages. I could say many more things about this, but maybe it's enough, otherwise you will tell me that um, I, I have become a sort of a preacher rather than a physicist. And uh, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, so now I would like to go uh, to a second topic. The second topic is a, a little bit of landscape of <laughs> mathematical physics. It's the way I see, but maybe you have then different ideas and this may be uh, the origin of a certain discussion. I see four major peaks. The, these look a little like the, those hills in China, you know, uh, very steep hills. And I see roughly four of them, and we will try to find out what they stand for. What Oh, well, Arthur Jaffe always tells us we should write the union because mathematical physics is the union of mathematics and physics rather than the intersection. So in honor of Arthur, I wrote this union. <laughs> so these are peaks on a certain island. This here is the ocean of the unknown. And so this is my island here. And so we have to find out what these peaks stand for. But before I say what they stand for, what people often forget, and uh, maybe this has something to do with the fact that nowadays we have to be very professional, we have to focus on one particular thing, but they forget that there should be bridges. So for example, between A and B, I tend to think there is a suspension bridge. And then maybe here it's an old bridge. It looks like an aqueduct of uh, Roman origin. Okay. And then maybe between C and D there is a, a street with tunnels. 
and these connections often are missing. So what do A, B, C, and D stand for? So A stands for conceptual problems. This is sort of a, I would say, maybe somewhat un-American uh, peak. Uh, Americans are pragmatic, they want to solve concrete problems. Here, this is not about solving concrete problems, but to clarify what we are talking about, to clarify the big picture and so on. And so let me give some examples of conceptual problems of which I believe they are important and some of them have been neglected in an almost scandalous way. One of them is uh, what does quantum mechanics mean? This is probably one of the most important general conceptual problems that we are faced with. Now, I wanted to give a seminar here about this conceptual problem and in fact I gave one but that was just a survey of sort of the standard uh, mantra that people talk about but then I wanted to give another one where I wanted to expose my own ideas and it failed completely because after five minutes the question started and they never stopped, and I didn't even get into the th over the first third of my talk. And it was snowing, and it, was, it just was a total failure. And, you know, surprisingly, with the exception of Joel and some of his cri uh, b people, nobody asked me afterwards what I would have said if, I, if the questions had not been so numerous. That I found a little disappointing, to be honest because I believe this is a very important question. <laughs> of course, the prejudice is that only people who are old and a little bit senile think about it. And I may not be a counterexample, but I still have some hopes that I'm a counterexample. And I even believe I've made a little progress. And I would like to tell you one thing, what we are taught in the standard courses about quantum mechanics in connection with the Copenhagen in, uh, interpretation and so on, is what I would call an intellectual pacifier. It is obviously doesn't make sense. It, uh, it, 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 the mathematicians, for good reasons, never understand it. Nevertheless, we transmit this from one generation to the next without worrying, and that bothers me. I think it's an intellectual scandal, and so we have to take this problem seriously. So, another problem that I personally like quite a lot is the foundations of thermodynamics. That is an interest I share with Elliot, except we have somewhat different approaches, but I think the union of our two approaches uh, gives a good picture of what's going on. So, as an example, I am interested in understanding where the first and the second law come from. The first law is basically a definition. There's nothing deep about it. The second law is much deeper. It has something to do with entropy production. I mean, I could now talk what the second law is and how I understand it and what it can be derived from. But maybe we won't do that, but I think it is of interest. The, by far the deepest problem in this con connection is the zeroth law. And I have, don't have a good understanding of the zeroth law. I was hoping that I would learn something about it by coming here, because some people at Rutgers have worried about it, and I think David Hughes has worried about it, but they never t tell me what what their insights are, so I haven't, haven't made much progress. What is the zeroth law? The zeroth law says that if you have a macroscopically big system, and you assume that the energy density is finite, you 
we probably also want to assume some kind of homogeneity for other observables of the system. The state should have some homogeneity. We don't want to have currents, so maybe the currents should be, you know, whatever this precisely means, but let's suppose that there are no currents in the system. And now I let the system sit by itself. I close it in my lab, I leave my lab, and then I come back after two months. And then I measure locally how the state looks like, locally. In finite regions, assuming that the total system is extremely large. Well, then the state locally looks like an equilibrium state. That's the zeroth law. The zeroth law says that there are heat paths that are locally in thermal equilibrium. The question is, how do we understand this? I think most people either have some kind of very soft theorem <laughs> involving some kind of ergodicity or entanglement or whatever, but there is no good understanding as far as I know. But since I wasn't given any lectures by the specialists in New Jersey, I may be wrong. But in any event, it seems to me, while there is a lot of understanding about the origin of the first and the, zero and the second law, the zeroth law is really the most fundamental one. And I think it would be great if we understood more about it. All right. Uh, more generally. Yeah, I, of course, that's a good question. I would say that it means, well, we can either look at it classically or quantum mechanically. What, what's your option? Well, you're in thinking in terms of a model. No, no. I think there is a general characterization of what we mean by equilibrium, but the convenient characterizations for classical and for quantum models are different. So we have to decide. No, no, I mean classical physics and quantum physics. Yeah. Look, <laughs> let's look at quantum, if you don't mind. So let's look at observables, operators that measure something about or express some properties of the system that are localized in this red region. Let's suppose A and B belong to the red region. Let rho be the state. I would hope that rho alpha t b, alpha t shifts the operator b from, time, from a fiducial time, let's say zero to time t, that this will be very close to rho of alpha t plus i beta b a. This is what is called the KMS condition. Okay, now the KMS condition will not be true exactly, but for all practical purposes, it will be true locally. That's what, how I would characterize equilibrium. What is alpha t? The time evolution. So you're thinking in terms of the model? Well, I mean, no. Yeah. No, <laughs> because I think I cannot do I physics. Of course, uh, but this is a general characterization of what I mean by well equilibrium. Well, I don't know what you mean by a physical so definition. I I'm not against introducing a model, but so if we now. Why are you, you ask me what I mean by local Basically equilibrium, clear, and that is the answer. That's what I mean by so local equilibrium. I, no, I need a time evolution, whether it's given in terms of a Hamiltonian or something else is up so to you to decide. How do you, how do you measure this then? Yeah. 
Pardon? You cannot speak it in extra minutes. It takes no sense. Well, I mean, this is now mathematics and not what you see in the lab. Oh. Now, in, you see, in the lab, I would probably start to uh, use a thermometer and stick it in locally and see whether it shows me a certain temperature. I mean, we can actually, you see, if you want to go to the lab, I can tell you what I would do if I were an experimentalist. I have my big macroscopic system, and I have a small system. The small system may be some quantum oscillator, for example, or maybe a spin even, just a few spins. I bring this small system in contact with the big one. So there is a contact, and here is a small system. I hope I can see whether the small system is in an equilibrium state. You see, of course, you can ask why is that possible, but and I have probably don't have a very good answer. But for a thermometer, we believe we see that our mercury is in thermal equilibrium. My thermometer. So, if the small system equilibrates is in a certain time, namely approaches a state that looks like it's equilibrium state, then I will say apparently the macroscopic system was Again locally in equilibrium. Equilibrate. Pardon? Again you use the word equilibrate. You still haven't told me what that means. So, look, Elliot, I said I assume we know oh, what we mean. Me. I'm like no, I'm not, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure whether I excuse you. <laughs> but, but, but I'm willing to make one more effort. <laughs> I tend to think we know roughly what we mean by, look, suppose this is a cavity. Fill it with radiation. Do we agree that we can find out whether our radiation is in thermal equilibrium or not just by spectroscopy? I think we can. Okay. It's what? It's, it's difficult, but it was difficult. but it was done by Ruben and yeah, Rubens and Kuhlbaum and so on. And I believe if you don't like the spectroscopy, then you go and take your thermometer and read off your temperature. This, of course, a temperature by itself is probably not quite enough to characterize equilibrium, but it's an indication. So let's imagine all possible ways of trying to figure out whether there is equilibrium locally. You can use the temperature, the cavity, and your favorite spin systems, and your laser, and whatever. And if they all agree that locally there is a well-defined temperature, and the states of these devices approach what looks like their equilibrium states, then I will say we have local equilibrium. Now, I'm sufficiently mathematical that if I think about this conceptually as a sort of theorist, I'm perfectly happy with this characterization, even if this is not an instruction for an experimentalist of something to measure. Okay. You put your finger on a very important point about thermodynamics, namely what is equilibrium. It's a very difficult question. I think it is a very difficult question, yes. Let's agree on that. I believe thermodynamics... We look at gases and we can tell them Pardon? We look at gases and we can tell them Absolutely, yes. Some spectrum is pretty messy. They're not in equilibrium in any sense of the alpha scheme. Yes. But they say that way to the age of the universe or something of that kind. So we kind of... Well, no, sta stationarity by itself is not enough. I mean, that's totally clear. I can easily give so. 
But I'm not saying that equilibrium is all of physics. I try to explain what I mean by the zeroth law. No more, no less. Okay? I know that stationary states are important. For example, if you want to understand the second law, you have to have some understanding of stationary states. And in fact, I think another thing that is very nice to do when you think about thermodynamics is to look at cyclic processes. And uh, for example, Jeff remembers that when I was working on these. Pardon? We what? I think we should, but this we, we, we now got a little bit sidetracked <laughs> on the thermodynamics. But <laughs> Jeff was in Zurich as a young man, as a postdoc. And he remembers that I was very interested in understanding what isothermal processes were. And in the end, I had a graduate student. His name was Walid Abu Salem. He was a Palestinian from Lebanon. He's now in Canada. You might know him. So uh, he needed a good problem for his PhD. And so we looked into the question, what are isothermal processes? And I think we came up with a good answer. It involved proving a somewhat new type of adiabatic theorem. So these problems are sufficiently difficult, as Eliot emphasizes, that if one takes them seriously, one might end up doing reasonably interesting and even reasonably concrete work. Well, I have various further issues here, characterization of physical states for such macroscopic systems, not just equilibrium, you know, non-equilibrium stationary states, etc. Time periodic states. Why do, if you stir a system periodically in time, why does the state also become periodic in time? That's already something that requires a little thought to understand, and so on. And also conceptual problems, scope of universality. How universal is universality? I think we don't understand this at all, as far as I can tell. But everybody, whenever people don't understand what they're doing, they appeal to universality, and then things are solved, right? <laughs> all right. Effective dynamics, transport. I, I need my glasses. Sorry. So effective dynamics, transport, derivation of the Boltzmann or the Navier-Stokes equation or of diffusion and, it's, and so on. Uh, relativistic quantum field theory and beyond origin of gauge symmetries and so on. These are all, I mean, I cannot write down everything, otherwise we will be still here at, after lunch. So these are conceptual problems A. B. B is the concrete problems that also people in North, so these are the conceptual problems. Now concrete also sounds like CP. That's a problem. Concrete problems. These are the problems that even people in North America would find worth thinking about. So lots of experiments in a lab are actually made for systems in thermal equilibrium. You know, when you look at the magnet, usually. It is heated to a certain temperature, the pressure around it is fixed, and so on. So it's in an equilibrium state. And so the whole issue of understanding equilibrium states of condensed matter is, uh, you know, absolutely wonderful and fascinating, and it is always good for a surprise again. And so let's maybe just mention a few examples. I spent some time in the 90s trying to uh, develop what I called the gauge theory of gauge theory of uh, states of matter and of phase transitions. What was the purpose of this? The purpose was actually really to construct the suspension bridge, to try to bring a little conceptual order into the analysis 
of condensed matter physics. I wrote long lecture notes for Lesouche in 1994. I think nobody in the room has ever looked at them, but I think they're still worth looking at. Uh, so this had some applications. One of the applications was to understand more about the quantum Hall effect. This is, in fact, what originally motivated the entire enterprise. And I got interested in the Hall effect in the 80s. Of course, a little too late, as usual. I'm always a little too late. But uh, I did some work, and I still enjoy it. I've never been asked by mathematical physicists to talk about that work before Elliot invited me to talk about it here a few weeks ago. That I find, that's another, you know, a little bit of a surprising story. Why is it surprising? This work, of course, doesn't prove where the fractional quantum Hall effect comes from starting at the level of the Schrödinger many-body operator. That's too difficult for me, and it turns out it's too difficult for apparently almost everybody else. So I start from a few reasonable general ideas about what a two-dimensional electron gas is that exhibits the quantum Hall effect. But once I have made these assumptions, I can bring in, I think, very pretty mathematics, for example, the mathematics of odd integral lattices, as I tried to explain in the mathematical conversation a few weeks ago and also in the seminar. And I found it a little surprising that this was totally uninteresting to the math physics community. But in fact, I also investigated insulators. And, you know, I feel I'm entitled to say that some of the proposals that were made really amounted to saying that they are not just ordinary insulators, they are also insulators that nowadays are called topological. This was totally uh, missed. Uh, nobody took it seriously, but it's a fact. And I also looked at the duality in two dimensions for 2D systems between insulators and superconductors. And from the point of view of this duality, the fractional Hall, if the two-dimensional electron gases exhibiting the Hall effect are self-dual. So this was, I think, an interesting development. I enjoyed it a lot. But obviously, at some point, you want to become concrete. And I was lucky that I had younger colleagues around with much more energy for hard technical work. And uh, their names are Joel Feldman, Horst Knerrer, and Eugene Trubowitz. And they undertook it to develop a variant of the renormalization group methods that can be applied to many body theory. And in fact, they had the ambition of doing mathematically rigorous work. So their idea was to understand what is a Fermi liquid by using renormalization group methods and proving theorems all the way through. This was an enterprise that took them, kept them busy for, I think, 20 years. And, you know, I think they were really the first, before the physicists, who made a serious attempt to say what it means to do renormalization group calculations for many body theory. So that's why I thought I should mention this. And I think that the enterprise has a disadvantage. It's very hard to read their work. It's very long and tedious. And they never, unfortunately, agreed to write some kind of summary, which is a mistake. If we have done something nice and we want to communicate it to the world, we should occasionally write a nice review paper. So I'm waiting for the KPZ review. Probably it exists, but I certainly need one. And I hope you will tell me which ones I should look at. OK, so uh, I wanted to draw attention to this work on uh, Fermi liquid theory. 
There are other things that, you know, BCS, for example, I tried to apply the ideas of Feldman, Knell, Bogowitz to the BCS problem. Of course, I could not prove theorems, but I did some kind of leading order in normalization group analysis of superconductors. It's also published in my Lesouche lectures in 1994. I think it does explain a little more about superconductivity than what was in the books at the time. Another project that is still underway, certainly not by myself, but by younger people with more energies to understand translation in where in Bose gases and Bose Einstein condensation in the thermodynamic limit. Seems to be extremely difficult to do that for interacting Bose gases. Uh, one could be more modest and say, Let's just look at the problem of Bose-Einstein condensation in the mean field limit, and then Benjamin comes into the picture. But the problem is, we so far, we don't understand whether the mean field limit and the thermodynamic limit commute. So the best we can do is to uh, analyze Bose gases in the mean field limit for ever larger systems, but you have to make the volume big in dependence of how close you are to the mean field regime. That can be done. I think that's not uninteresting, but it's definitely not the final point of the exercise. But Benjamin is still young, and he's very talented, so I I'm optimistic he will probably get there at some point. Uh, there is a related problem, somewhat related to Bose gases, that's magnetism. I think Elliot would agree that our, the absence of real understanding of magnetism is almost scandalous. Would you agree on that? I mean, we certainly don't, we don't really understand in a precise way how exchange interactions are uh, emerge from the many body physics, and uh, even if we assume that we understand that, we don't know how to, under, uh, how to analyze phase diagrams, say, of ferromagnets, of quantum ferromagnets, and so on. So there are lots of very interesting problems that are concrete and technical and that have something to do with this peak B. Uh, then, of course, also among B, since uh, Yao wants us to talk about non-equilibrium, one of the problems that I think would be nice to understand a little better is something that perhaps can be formulated as follows. As follows, uh, quenched disorder. versus, you know, some Born-Oppenheimer analysis. So, for example, if you look at the conductivity of a semiconductor that has a disordered magnetic background, if you treat the disordered background in a quenched way, you get the system for which you can apply Tom's methods, or also the ones of Eisenman and of Burger and so on, to prove localization. But this is clearly an approximation. The magnetic background has its own dynamics. The spins, you know, precess a little bit, and but the dynamics has a very sort of, s uh, the time scale of this motion is very big in comparison to the time scale of motion of the electrons. We would like to understand more about how the limit of quench disorder is approached dynamically. And in particular, you know, I tend to think localization is not a robust phenomenon. It's probably something that disappears as soon as there is a little dynamics in the disorder. And so we would like to understand, for example, how a conductivity how a conductivity uh, vanishes as the time scale of the disorder tends to infinity. Now, 
maybe this is known, but it's certainly not known to me, and I find this a worthwhile problem. I've discussed it with some people present, and I hope at some point there will be a little progress there. All right. Uh, there are lots of problems about disorder. There are lots of problems about uh, transport. So how much do we understand about the origin of Ohm's law? Uh, probably not too much, but uh, there is one situation where we understand rather well. And it shows how little is understood there. Take two reservoirs, which, for example, are ideal Fermi gases, no interactions. You hook them up locally by you know, making the fermions interact here with those there. And let's suppose the chemical potentials are different for these two reservoirs. Well, then, in fact, there is a theorem that says that the current that goes through the connection behaves like mu1 minus mu2 times a, conduct, a conductance. Let's call it g. And this g can be, for sufficiently simple models of such contacts, g can be computed. Another thing can be computed too, and that is the amount of entropy that is produced per, per second by the transport from one to the other reservoir. So this is a, an example where we, can, uh, where we have an explicit formula for entropy production. But of course, you know, this is maybe not a very exciting situation, so we would like to understand something more interesting. For example, we might want to understand what happens when you let the particle, an electron, say, wander through a thermal bath, what happens? And uh, that's the problem of the quantum Brownian motion that I have worked on some time ago with, together with Dirk. We have only been able to analyze very simple models. And I think it's at best the beginning, but it was enough of a, a progress that we became a little more ambitious and then Kevin Ginelli, who is here in the audience, and who was, I think, in some sense, my last PhD student. He was asked to worry about the question, what happens if you have a particle in the, a particle that moves through a reservoir and is pushed by an external force? So here is my reservoir, and then there is a particle. This particle is green, and it is pushed by an external force to move through the reservoir. And we want to understand what happens. And so one of the hopes was that Kevin would be smart enough to prove the Einstein relation. V is the velocity of the particle in a stationary state that is approached when you wait for a while. It obviously depends on the force that you apply. We can uh, differentiate V of f with respect to f, and then let f tend to zero. And then we can ask, is this a quantity that is known? And the idea is, and it goes back to Einstein, that this is beta times the diffusion constant. Do I get, uh, did I get the right, uh, is beta on the right side, Kevin? So this is called the Einstein relation. And for some, I have to say, rather contrived models of such particles, in, in particular these particles have to hop on a lattice, Kevin was able to prove this Einstein relation, along with various other results. This is far from easy. It was 
fact, a considerable effort that went into this work. But it has some big, it raises some huge questions. So, for example, I'm willing to make a bet with everybody present in this room that if you look at the continuum model, particle moving in the continuum and moving through a, say, a quantum gas, a Bose gas or so, there is no Einstein relation. And I could explain why that is, but maybe let's not. Would you like to know why it, it fails? Or no, that's not clear. No, it is not clear. You see, uh, because of the interaction of the particle with the medium, you could imagine that there is enough friction so that you still approach a stationary state. And the question is, why is that not? It, it, and this is happening on the lattice. And you can ask, why is it not happening in the continuum? Absolutely. It oh, it's a very general fact. And here, here is the answer. Why is it a very general fact? You see, when you look at the amount of friction uh, that corresponds to a certain velocity of the particle, so I plot here the friction force as a function of the velocity of the particle as it moves through the medium. For any potential different from a delta function, which is not uh, a very reasonable thing, for any potential of that has some regularity property, the graph of f of v looks like this. Let's, I mean, there are a few subtleties that I don't want to go into. Looks like this. It increases up to a certain speed, v star, say, and then it goes down again. That's how it looks. And now you can say, well, a stationary state is approached if the force that drives the particle is compensated by the friction force. If this external force is not too large, then the equation f equals f of v has solutions. But unfortunately, it has two solutions, a stable one and an unstable one. If the medium is thermal, it will always happen occasionally that the particle will be kicked to a at least for a short time, to an anomalously large velocity. But then when you push, it goes down the drain, it becomes faster and faster. And only if you have a delta function potential, this function sort of keeps increasing and you have only the stable solution. So Herbert is right, but it, you, have to, you need a very, in some sense, very unphysical interaction. Well, this has been computed for two body potentials that have a certain regularity. And the, pardon? Uh, that's not so important. It's, uh, you can characterize it better by looking at uh, the momentum space behavior. W is the two body potential. I don't know, maybe Kevin might remember. You need some. Uh, I think the important thing is some decay in K. So you need a little smoothness of the two-body potential in X space. And you can say, well, maybe this is not physical, but I think a delta function or a hard core is also not so physical. I'm just warning you what we learn in school about these uh, dissipation fluctuation relations is far from obviously true, and in fact, most of the time, I think these relations fail, and it's 
some interest, I think, to understand when they are true and when they fail. Well, you know, one could also talk about current fluctuations, entropy fluctuations, the appearance of universal current fluctuations. It appears that this is something very interesting to various people at the moment, Altschüler and so on. Conductance fluctuations. Can we use random matrix theory to understand conductance fluctuations? You let electrons move through a cavity that has a random geometry. And then the, the levels of the Laplacian inside, the, inside uh, the cavity are random. And so maybe you, c I guess you can apply some random matrix theory to understand the conductance fluctuations. But this is something I have not learned. I'm not quite sure that I understand what I'm talking about. But I think this is one of the problems. I wanted to say something about quantum optics, but it's too late to do that. I think there are lots of really interesting problems in quantum optics, namely in understanding the interactions between charged matter and the radiation field, and this is something I have spent a lot of time on, probably more than I should have, but I could afford it. I don't regret it. And I believe there are still lots of good problems there. I could easily talk for an hour about problems in quantum optics, but let's not. Uh, okay. Then, of course, B4 fourth item in peak B is astrophysics and cosmology. You know, he, here there are these wonderful experiments uh, called BICEP. I don't know how it's pronounced. BICEP, or how do you pronounce it? They measure the polarization of the CMB and claim on the basis of theoretical calculations that this reveals something about the spectrum of gravitational waves at a very, very early stage of the evolution of the universe. Now, I don't know how trustworthy this theory is. I don't know how good the experiments are, but this is clearly, I think, astrophysics and cosmology has lots of fascinating problems. And I once had a diploma student who wanted to do work on that, and I suggested a problem about cosmic magnetic fields. It was quite obvious by going through the literature that some of those people would need some support in the mathematics. You know, the mathematics can be very sloppy and sometimes it's also conceptually quite confused. So if we turned our minds to some of these astrophysics and cosmology problems, I think we could have some impact. That's uh, certainly my opinion about this. Uh, I have a uh, nice list of concrete examples uh, but I think it's too late to go through the list. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to say more about it. Uh, well, there are lots of further things. I'm, get, I'm a little slow, I guess. What is peak C? Peak C is concerns the interactions between mathematical physics and computation. And I think this is an extremely important frontier, uh, both for practical reasons. Once we understand how to use computers cleverly, which is unfortunately, I have to admit, not my case. I have no idea how to use them cleverly. But people who do uh, can you know, attack problems that are just beyond handmade analysis and nevertheless very interesting. But you can also use computers, of course you know that very well, to guess results and then even prove them. And of course the good examples that are always quoted in this context are, uh, you know, Feigenbaum. I think Feigenbaum would not have found his stuff without his computer experiments. This gave rise to Lanford's, Lanford's enterprise to prove the Feigenbaum conjecture using computer-aided methods. And I think this is you know, one of the really 
wonderful developments that appeared. Uh, it uh, then, of course, you know, Ekman was involved, and some of his students, for example, Karch and Witwer used computer-aided methods to construct renormalization group fixed points in statistical mechanics. Uh, I think, unfortunately, in some sense, they gave up after a while, but I regard this as an important development. More recently, you know, one of the people who is visiting here is Michael Reiterer. I tend to think that his work with Trubowitz on general relativity using computer-aided methods is a little bit opaque because the computer has played a big role and so it's not so easy to penetrate it, but I think it's very interesting and it's a development that we should be aware of. And in our education of young people, I think we have to pay attention to the idea that they should be encouraged to, to be, uh, you know, quite fluent in using computers in their work. So, I mean, there are also uh, examples from particle physics. You know, the whole ARPIT project uh, in Rome that was probably largely driven by Parisi, but also Gabibo. Uh, they developed the special purpose computer. I think Martin Lüscher is a guy who did a lot of interesting computational work using the ARPE for QCD, and he's a good example of somebody who also knows to do how to do mathematical physics. Some of his results on gauge theory are you know, very clear and precise mathematically and of considerable importance. So what is D? Well, D is what everybody nowadays talks about. Because presumably some kind of fog is lying over the other peaks. So what is D? It's applications. So, so these applications, what we hear often nowadays that uh, the 21st century is the century of the life sciences, forgetting that life sciences wouldn't exist without all the physics-driven methods, the experimental methods used by Biologists are largely physics driven, so physics is not at all useless. But um, certainly that's what you hear, that our center is the center of the life sciences. So, applica so these applications and one of the prominent applications concerns biology. And probably David Hughes might say something about this. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, there are other people who are more opportunistic and they do econophysics. Pardon? That would be the next item, mathematical finance. Of course, there the verb physics has has disappeared, but at least mathematics still appears in the title. There are many other applications, for example, you know, quantum information and so on. People believe this has applications. I would have mentioned quantum information already under A and B and so on, but let's at least mention it now under D. Uh, complexity theory. We had these beautiful talks about the Parisi solution of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And uh, people may ask, why is that interesting? And then the answer tends to be, well, it has some relation to the traveling salesman problem and to various problems in you know, P versus MP and complexity and so on. I'm not the guy who understands these things, certainly not better than anybody else in this room, but that's what people claim. I think if one wants to do, so one further, we now have to wrap things up. I started by talking about myself and my younger years. 
and how I grew up at ETH and what the general atmosphere was. The atmosphere was certainly far less opportunistic than it tends to be nowadays. But in any event, one of my teachers, namely Klaus Hepp, got uh, tired of mathematical physics and moved into the neurosciences, which is certainly very applied. It should be added here. Neurosciences. Now, I think he did something which I admire profoundly. He went to the lab, to, uh, the lab of a physician at the university hospital who was studying the vision of monkeys by drilling electrodes into the brains of monkeys. Of course, nowadays one would feel that this is terrible. It's a sort of, a, you know, these poor monkeys will suffer and so on. But at the time it was done. And he, Klaus Hepp was playing the role of the graduate student who took measurements. It was a time when you would record the data by pencil in a paper notebook. You know, he once invited me uh, before I returned to Zurich to visit him in his lab. And it was certainly not the most exciting situation that you can imagine. But he was sufficiently humble to feel that if he wants to move into a new field, has, he has to learn the trade from the bottom up. And I think that's the right thing. If we want to do applications, we have to listen to those people who solicit our help and understand what their problems are and sort of learn the trade from the bottom up. Unfortunately, I have not been able to do that in my own career, but I think it is it may be an attractive possibility for mathematical physicists. Well, I think it's time to stop. I hope I have said enough, and if you have...